Good morning. Um, for a bunch of gamers, I'm very grateful that you came this morning. Um, I have to admit to you that when I was invited to do this, I got some insider information from a couple of Unity people who will remain nameless, um, who told me that I better be funny because most of you were out drinking heavily last night. <laughs> um, I wasn't. I, I was making sure that my videos worked. Um, but I would like to ask you all a question. Um, how many of you know what Scratch is? Okay. How many of you know what Logo is? Oh, good. All right. So um, I've been a little surprised lately about how people have sort of lost our history. So here's another question. How many of you had a, a, the original Game Boy as your first device? First. first. <laughs> how many of you actually owned an Atari? Oh, okay, we're in good shape. All right, so you guys know the history. I don't need to say very much, okay? Um, how many of you were actually programmed on something like an Apple IIe? Oh, my Lord. Okay, I'm home. I wasn't sure I was home. Um, my shtick forever has been creators with rather than consumers of computing, and the National Science Foundation and Microsoft and a number of institutions have allowed me to make that statement, and they always haven't followed up on actually implementing it. So it's really exciting to be here at Unity where there's a commitment to this idea, and I'm, I want to thank um, the, the people who persuaded me to spend 48 hours on a plane, and the shout out I'm going to give is to Carl Domingo, who had the courage to ask me some really good questions at SIGGRAPH last year. So um, the first thing I'm going to say is that I tend to talk about interactive storytelling um, rather than games because in the circles that I run around in, which is seri serious academia, interactive storytelling sounds really cool and games are kind of scary. Um, so how have I done this? Um, I've done this to teach computer science. Um, I was part of Jan Cooney's uh, program broadening participation in computing where we built an interactive journalism institute for middle schoolers and this was a coy way of getting those kids introduced to scratch. This was about a decade ago. And so it was truly multidisciplinary. Um, they built stories, news stories, they built si simulations in scratch and um, they also built video and it was one of the first times we really saw that middle schoolers um, not your socioeconomically privileged middle schoolers, but mi middle schoolers in what's called a RIM district, a stable working class district, were able to use computing to be creative in a number of modalities. What was really important about this is we used games of all kinds to teach each other, and we also used games to teach another context, which was writing. And the teachers involved in this program, um, and you can see Laura Fay in the corner there, um, were language arts teachers. And what all of these people involved in this program had in common was a passion for interactivity in games. What was really important here was to be able to have a curricular focus. Um, we were able to do what we were trying to do because we were, were totally unaccountable for teaching them any computer science. And so it was integrated very quickly into their language arts classrooms because the teachers were accountable to a language arts curriculum, but not to a computer science curriculum. And I'm going to circle back on this idea a number of times as we go along. So, you know, where did this program come from? And I'm still working on this program. You'll see some things we're doing more recently that were, were based out of this. Um, where have I come from? Well, it really started with Seymour Papert and Logo. I was an undergraduate researcher in his lab, and I intentionally made that very faint example on the top there, which is what we thought was incredibly cool in 1978. Okay, the fact that you could make something like that was just so neat. Okay, um, the other thing you might see there is that's a classic logo tree. Okay, it's a recursive tree and I still claim that doing that with a turtle rather than doing it with Cartesian graphics is a much nicer way to explain real recursion to people. Um, the other thing in my background, which is something I've discovered is almost unknown, this is a piece of history that's pretty much disappeared, um, is there was a magazine out there in the, in the dark ages in 1980 um, called Creative Computing. Anybody know that one? Some of you, yeah, go Google it. There was a, some really cool stuff in there. Um, Dave All actually published 
basic games, like type them out, and people would spend their hours typing in those games. Okay, that was a form of remixing back then. Um, Dave was also responsible for building or contributing to something called the Computer Gallery at Sesame Place, and we launched it in 1980. We had 54 games. They were connected to um, one of the first networks that was out there. You can barely see that there were these really funky, weird things, but the reason we had, and they were coin operated. And it was right before um, big video game, uh, the big consoles came out. What was significant about this environment is that all of the games were designed by, by Stephen Gass, who um, also was responsible for Cabbage Patch Kids along the way. And he had a real commitment to making sure that the games were truly accessible to lots of different kinds of kids. So we minimized the amount of text. We had things like a version of um, Hangman, which was just a little guy. He didn't even have hands because we didn't have the, the, the memory space to actually give this poor little animated creature hands. And this is what he did. You'd, you'd type a character, he'd run over to the box and run back. And we did that on an 8K Apple. Okay, so we were looking at some of the same issues you all are looking at today in terms of memory space and, and time, but in a very different environment. Um, there was a reemergence of the concept creative computing, and um, I've been part of this, this world for the last, oh God, it is over almost two decades. That's very scary. Um, but the book that I'm promoting here, um, um, Ira Greenberg and Diane Atsu and Deepak Kumar, they've had a series of projects on bringing computation and creativity together. And you can see on the, on the side there, one of Diana's trees um, that's a bit more sophisticated than the little flower at the top there. And when we talk about creative computing, we are talking about blending art and computing in the classroom. And so we're not talking about teaching computer science and we're not talking about teaching digital art. We're talking about the intersection. Um, and most recently, people are starting to talk about this thing called contextualized computing. And I'm working on that in a project up in Bennington, Vermont, where we have a group of students who are sadly labeled at risk. These are freshman high school students who are at risk of not graduating from high school in a community where 60% people, 60 of the people live below the poverty line. And over the last six months, very tentatively, we have started introducing them to computing and technology through a phenomenal website that they're building through Google Sites. And they're learning all kinds of things about networks, about URLs, about precise language. And we're tentatively taking steps into JavaScript. And we have a goal next year of actually bringing them into Unity. And I'm going to show you some of that stuff a bit later. The last picture you see there, if you're savvy about logo, um, that's actually a tree spun around the total turtle trip. And it was done, it was rendered with an embroidery machine using a language called Turtle Stitch. So creativity comes in many different forms and flavors. And in terms of the contextualized, we're starting to think beyond computers and art, okay? And one of you, the speakers later, Sarah, is gonna talk to you a bit about how this works in the sciences. Okay, so this idea that computer science is over here and it's hard, all right, it isn't. Okay, and anybody who tells you that it's hard doesn't get it. Okay. So where does this come from? There's a term called constructionism, um, which is an idea that comes from Seymour Papert, and it, it's very similar to, but it's somewhat different from inquiry-based learning. The current um, approach to this is Scratch, and Scratch is the descendant of microworlds, which is the dis descendant of, um, of Logo, and there were lots of contributing ideas along the way. Um, for older people, we can just debate about whether Pascal was part of this movement or something that sidetracked it. Back in the 70s and 80s, we had the basic wars. Should we teach logo? Should we teach basic? Okay. But what, what it really came down to is what were the resources available to people? Okay. How do you learn this stuff? What if your teacher really doesn't know as much as you do? And we had two solid generations of kids who knew four times as much about how to, how to program a computer and how to create a little video game or to create a simulation or hack into the student school records or fix the student school records than the teachers did. And this problem continues. And this is why it's exciting to be here today 
with all of you, because I think that's part of what we're all trying to do. How do we make this accessible to more people in a way that empowers everyone to be creators? And so what I captured was two of the, the resources that are available on the Scratch site. Um, one of them is their set of tutorials, which are cool, okay? But if I have a particular task that I'm trying to do right now, okay, I want that piece of information here. Okay, I don't want to have to go digging through these cool tutorials to find it. And the other side of the problem is one that a friend of mine um, told me is what is being affectionately known as the, the script kitty problem. Is that a lot of people are able to do tutorials and work through them and think they know something, but when they have to build something of their own, when they have to be innovative about it, when they have to be creative, they're stuck. Okay? And the hypothesis right now, and I'm going to pull it from scratch, and I'm part of the Scratch community, and the Scratch community has been really good to me, and I enjoy working in it, and I like getting kids started in it, but Scratch suffers from this too. There's an overwhelming amount of unorganized information. Okay, so if you go to the Scratch site and you Google Woe Dunn, who happens to be my business partner, Chris Dunn, okay, he was one of the original Scratch kids and um, he was actually one of the students that was followed in the early days when he was, a, was very young. Okay, you go, you, you Google Woe Dunn and you get an amazing collection of projects that are his and projects that have been remixed from his, but you still can't find that piece of information that you want in order to move your work forward. And from my perspective, not only can't you find it, but you, if you do find it, you may end up finding information that's not quite right. So here's the dilemma, is that these, these micro worlds, and Unity is a micro world, it's a safe place in which to, in which to play. Um, Pappert and now, now Resnick talk about um, no threshold, no ceiling. How do you enter it and how do you just grow and expand? And you need a programming language in order to do that. And Mitch Resnick introduced this idea of very wide world walls. Okay. But what Mitch really meant is walls that allow students, kids, amateurs, professionals to do the thing we love to do, which is games. But when we're trying to teach this stuff, if we're going to use games as a vehicle, okay, or if we're going to use science as a vehicle, or if we're going to use art as a vehicle, who defines the learning goals? Okay, think about the project that you worked on most recently. Where did it come from? Was it an assignment? Okay, how did you maneuver your way through the path? Okay, the next question is what is the activity? What is it you actually have to do? Are you plug and playing? My friend Diana Tsu at Bryn Mawr is absolutely adamant. I do not want to write anything that has, that requires a student to just fill one procedure or one line of code in something big and complex. They have to assemble things. And MJ, Michael John, is going to talk beautifully about that a bit later, about how he's managed to do that in a classroom. Okay. Um, how is the learning assessed? How do I know that my, my activity actually taught somebody what it was that I wanted them to know? And so that's the challenge for all of us. How do we make that happen? Okay, and so the question is, do we do what we did back in the Logo Lab in the 70s and say traditional instructional design is, is, is dead? Okay, what Seymour really promoted, what he was really committed to was this idea of the individual being able to explore in an environment and construct their own theory about how something worked. Whether it was physics or math or a for loop or a data structure or an animation, Okay, it was discovery-based learning. But what if, what if my agenda for what I wanted them to learn at a particular time, and remember we're in the hopefully post-standardized testing world, not quite yet, but we're getting closer. How do we do that when my intent was for the student to take that path, but the student went that way? Is that learning valuable? Okay, what do we do about it? Okay, so what I'm going to propose to you is that these ideas, these three ideas, what is the learning goal, what is the activity, and what is, is the learning being assessed, are still important. But rather than thinking in terms of what is the teacher or the instructional designer um, or the standardized testing people, what is their agenda, is to use this in a generalized context. Gee, generalization, abstraction, computer people do that really well. So the other metaphor that's important, and this comes from Seymour Papert, is this notion of computer as pencil. 
All right, what's the tool that you want to use? Okay, so, you know, the pencil. Um, we can play with Crayola crayons, all right? And if I had a little more time, we would have some cool slides about how you can melt Crayola cr crayons and not use them at all for the task in which they are intended. Okay, but there are also, there's, there's the medium of pencil, okay? And there's this medium of oils. And then there's sculpture. And then there's textiles. And so where do you want to go with this? Is the medium that you're using the right one? And where I'm having some fun with that is working with programmable sewing, um, embroidery machines. Okay, it's a robot. It's just a little two-dimensional robot. And we are actually looking at problems that normally you would encounter in an algorithms class. More on that later, maybe, if I have time. Okay, so the right tool for the task. But the other important thing is what are you after? Are you after color by numbers? Or do you need art school? And where is the point in between? One of the things I used to hate about one of the schools that my children went to is when you walked down the hall, you saw the same piece of artwork from every child. Okay? I see a whole bunch of people smiling. All right? But think about this. When we teach computer science, we give them all the same assignment. Okay? And if you deviate from what we wanted, you lose points. Okay. So how can we think about this in a way that individuals can um, make their own work meaningful? And again, I'm going to defer that to one of the other um, speakers. What I want to talk about is what are the resources that we need? How do we make this happen in a way that, that is resource rich and accessible, both by the individual trying to solve the problem and by the teacher who's trying to figure out how to kind of push the pathway in the right direction? Okay, so here's my hypothesis, and this is what I've been working on for almost 40 years now, and I think I finally got it when Melissa Olden asked me whether I would do this keynote, okay? I've been preparing for a few weeks now. I finally got it. Teaching is storytelling is game design. They are the same thing, okay? So this is an old slide. My, my colleague, Kim Pearson, at the College of New Jersey, and I wrote a paper about this a long time ago. You get a prize if you can find it on the internet. It's a very buried paper. Um, lecture is linear storytelling, okay? And we have these different models up here, and these are pretty classic, and you can find these in the book. All right, but what Kim and I complained about, she's a journalist, what we complained about is this is not what it means to construct a story, okay? Because it's either going to go in all these directions, or again, I'm going that way and my student's going that way. So we have this problem with branching stories that we try to constrain them Okay, but as a computer scientist who actually knows something about algorithms, I happen to know that that thing um, is still fundamentally linear because I can prove that it's a non-deterministic finite automata and then I can prove it's deterministic and then I can prove it's a Turing machine and then it's just a sequence of steps. Okay, so if you're hesitant about taking a theory course, go take the theory course. It'll help your, it'll help your game development. Okay. So Kim and I started this conversation about multi-threaded storytelling. And we wrote this paper a long time ago. All right, what you can imagine is that each of these colored networks are different perspectives on the story. And we kind of got stuck here. And it wasn't until a few weeks ago that I finally understood, because of the class I'm teaching at the new school, which is called Do Machines Learn, where my students are each building an avatar who eventually has to be able to act like an intelligent agent and eventually has to be able to learn. This, by the way, is an, um, a liberal arts course. It's, it's not a computer science course and there are no prerequisites to it. And I'm also teaching them about coding in JavaScript, okay? But each of them is building their own story within the environment, okay? And I'll give you some examples of that in a bit. And then the other piece of this here is that what I'm talking about, is it just a game? Um, and I wanted to put in a plug for Querium, which is a company that's building AI tutors. But we're building the tutors a little bit differently, okay? Because what we did is we implemented the learning paths by hand, not with a machine learning padding, pattern matching algorithm, but by hand for all of common core math. I got fractions and logarithms, and one of the things I discovered is that the examples of how to teach logarithms in the Common Core website are wrong. They got the concept wrong, and the reason they got it wrong is when I programmed my learner, 
um, my, my tutor, it, it couldn't teach it right. It kept getting the wrong answer. So um, a game, multiple learning paths. Have you mapped out all the paths in your game? No. Okay. And I naively put this slide up a few days ago and said, and the assessments built in, and then I discovered that some people here at the conference had tried this and ran into the same problem that I've been running into for 40 years, is that you can't monetize educational software. Okay, well, some people can. They're called ETS and College Board, but the rest of us are having a little problem with it. Okay. Um, but one of the things that Kent and I keep looking at is the relationship between tutoring and games. And Kent's vision is could we walk around a game and learn concepts other than math? And that's one of the things I've been working on for about five years. What in the world does that game look like? Okay. Well, here's the beginning of it. Um, and I'm not going to run the slide because we're a little short on time. Oh, we got time. Okay. See, I'm going to get my video in. All right. Um, so we are building this, this game called Use Your Words, and this goes all the way back to one of the games that we built at the College of New Jersey in this multi-disciplinary um, uh, course, um, where we built a game called Zanahoria. Why there's a carrot there, it, it, the, me the metaphor is deep, and the idea behind Zanahoria back then was that you're on the College of New Jersey campus, and one of the students had actually rendered the whole campus in 3D, and again, this was almost... 10 years ago, so the technology wasn't quite as, as supportive. And you walked around the environment with a Wii controller, and you brushed your teeth, because it was based on this thing called total physical response, which is a serious language theory about how to teach people a foreign language. And so you brushed your teeth, you turned the alarm clock off, and eventually you had to develop the sophistication to actually use language, only there was a hitch. We didn't have voice. And at a Unity New York um, event last fall, I saw how in Unity you can do voice. And so my intern, Kyle Laytow, built this cool little version of it where you can walk around and send me an email and I'll, I'll share the video. We had trouble getting this one up, so it's, it's not showing. But you can talk to it in Unity. And so we have the architecture. We have, have the underlying architecture to build this thing. And the entire storyline, what we figured out, is in the character development. So each of the NPCs in the environment helps you to develop your language skills. All right? And we're just starting on that work. Now, the other thing that I've been working on forever is this idea of bite-sized information. Um, and the idea here, again, is a traversal through a path and if you want to go look at the video, um, because of the way Google does, does priorities, go to YouTube and then look for bite-sized computing. Okay? If you just say bite-sized computing, you get 400 other sites before ours comes up because nobody knows ours is there. So here's what we've been doing for four or five years. Our goal was rather than having these cool videos of people doing what I'm doing now, which is speaking extemporaneously and going, oh, I'm sorry, I did that wrong, and then reinventing, we have scripted short videos. Almost all of them are under three minutes. Our goal is less than five. Okay, there's a clear view of the code, and I'm not, not going to be able to do it here because we have to queue and unqueue and things, but you can actually stop the videos and examine the code. You don't have to rewind. But their goal is to be really short, teach a concept, and on the sly pull in another concept. And if you could queue this video now, that would be helpful. Let's say you want to embroider a snowflake. We're going to show you how to do that using movement and custom scripts. First things first, a little setup. Grab a when flag pressed block and stick a reset block underneath it. This will ensure that the turtle returns to its default position whenever we run our script. Now, our snowflake is going to have six branches. All snowflakes are symmetrical, so each of these branches needs to be exactly the same. To achieve this, we could just copy and paste out our code six times for each individual branch. That said, a much easier method would be to create our own blocks. Let's do that. Left click anywhere on the screen. This should give you the option to make a block. Select it. For now, we're not going to do anything too fancy with our branches. Let's just make a simple line, instructing our turtle to move 100 steps in 10, then negative 100 steps in 10. The one thing to remember is that for this to work, our turtle needs to return to its starting position every time, facing its original direction. In turtle geometry, this is what's known as a total turtle trip. Yeah, no, it's actually called that. 
that is a real, actual term in mathematics. Don't let anybody tell you mathematicians don't know how to party. Now that we've got our custom block, let's put it inside a repeat. We want six arms, so we'll set the repeat to six. 360 divided by six is 60, so we'll have the turtle turn 60 degrees after drawing each arm. Just like that, we have a snowflake. Kind of a boring snowflake, but a snowflake nonetheless. Let's see if we can spice things up a little. Add some stuff to your custom block, get as creative as you want, and uh, create something like this thing, I guess. Have fun. Okay, thank you. Let's do the next slide. Okay, how much time do I have? Oh! All right, you're not gonna get to see this video. Go find it yourselves, okay? This is the cool one. This is the one that makes a little bit of fun of you guys. Okay, it's got some humor in it, but it also teaches the two things that you all desperately want for your students, okay? They get two things on the screen. They want to be able to um, make that little thing move around, and they want to be able to make that thing collide with something else, okay? So again, if you go to um, YouTube and you look for bite-sized computing, you will find it, okay? What I'm going to tell you at this point is that if your students are starting with scratch, and almost all middle schoolers are, it's assumed, will be starting with scratch, and if you want to make video games, those are the two things that you want to do. Okay, when they hit Unity in the high school, or they hit Unity in your class, whether it's an art class or a computer science class or a science class, they're going to want to move and they're going to want to collide. And so we, we took all the fluff away. No, you don't need six hours of, of, of instruction in order to get to that code. It's right there in Chris's video, and it makes a little bit of fun of us, but, you know, he's a screenwriter. He kind of thinks that I'm dorky. But then he's the gamer, and I'm just the game designer. So, wrap up. Um, empowering creators, okay? In order to do that, you need contextualized computing. Gaming is a perfect context for teaching computing, okay? But it also requires a different kind of teaching. I can't have a goal that sends me that way when I have students who are being perfectly inventive and going in that direction. Okay, so how do we do this? Fire us an email. Come play with us. Keep track of what we're doing. Okay, my website is, is a combination of four years old and 30 seconds ago. Um, come play with us. Okay, let's make this a game. Thank you.